Hey guys, I want to make a video about intellectual Christianity, Calvinism, and circular reasoning. I wanted to make this video because I have seen a bunch of different YouTubers, apologists, make comments about the GES, Grace Evangelical Society, Bob Wilkins, and other Gospel of Gracers out there, basically saying the same thing they say right here in the title, that they're teaching phony grace and easy believism, which is the farthest thing from the truth. That, that being said, I don't agree with everything that GES says. If you don't know who GES is, it, it's basically an organization run by Bob Wilkin. If you don't know who Bob Wilkin is, I suggest look him up. You can listen to some of the things he has to say. I agree with most of what he has to say. And he is, you know, a gospel of grace teacher, or a gospel of grace believer. But um, I, I wanted to kind of point out some of the hypocrisies in these, I, I don't know if you want to call them intellectual, because it's truly not intellectual, but in this Calvinistic apologetics type ministry of even or um, intellectual Christianity that's what I I, I label it because a lot of them they try to act intellectual but it always brings me back to the verse in the Bible and I should have pulled it up but I didn't but where Jesus talks about thank you Lord he, he says thank you father for revealing these things to infants and hiding these things from the wise and the learned so I wanted to point out some of these inconsistencies these contradictions these circ the circular reasoning and hypocrisy of these you know I guess they're Calvinists because he, he hangs out with James White a lot, lot, who is a Calvinist, who I, I don't dislike James White, but I think that in their quest for knowledge, they have kind of become blind to a part of, or, you know, some of the truth. And Rob, Rob Zins also, he was an ex-Catholic, and you can go look up, watch his videos about Catholicism, and, and it, they're great. And he talks about how they rely upon their works, and, and, they, and what gets me is that they'll say that it's by faith alone, but then they'll go off and they'll right afterwards say something else. They'll say it's by faith alone, but then they'll go and say no, it's by your faith plus your works. I mean, they literally, I, they don't make any sense. And and to, for, to show you as an example, I'm not going to actually play where they say this, but in the title right here, it says, teaches phony grace and easy believism, talking about GES. And in the video, actually, he goes on to say that they have a clear understanding. And I, I wrote a comment about this because this was the last straw, and I unsubscribed from him because it was just, they're just contradicting what they're, it, it doesn't make any logical sense to say that. And then in the video, say that they have a clear understanding of the grace of God, which is what they said. You can watch the video for yourself. They also go in to say, you can't just go do whatever you want. And, and they start to defending work. They start defending works-based salvation. But then right afterwards, literally just a few moments after that, they start to say, "Well, it's by faith alone." And you can go watch it and see it. It's clear as day. Like it's just like it's hypocrisy or it's contradiction. And I wanted to point out some of these things and show you and talk about Calvinism just a little bit and how it's actually the opposite of faith. It's the opposite of what we are commanded to do. It, by Jesus Christ himself, it's the opposite of what the gospel is teaching, how it, and, and it makes sense if you're not discerning these things spiritually, you're just looking them, looking at them on the surface but when you actually stop and, and you take a, a look at what they're saying and what these Calvinists are telling you to believe, it's actually the opposite of faith, it's putting faith in your works, not putting faith in Christ Alright, so I'm not going to play any of this video. I will leave a link in the about below and you can go watch it and see everything that I'm talking about. And if you don't agree or if you disagree, let me know, but I'm pretty sure you'll see what I'm talking about because it's, it's one of the most, it's one of the clearest videos to show the contradictions of Calvinists and how they will attack these Gospel of Grace teachers, but then they actually sound exactly like the Gospel of Grace preachers for most of the time. It's just they attack them for some unknown reason. I still don't understand what, where they disagree other than they start at like it doesn't make sense like I, I don't understand I, I really don't understand you 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 can watch it and and if you say if you think it makes sense and if you can explain please explain it to me in the comments below but I want to move on and just talk about the gospel real quick and, and address some of the, the talking points of the Calvinists so let's go on to Ephesians 6 or Ephesians 6 Ephesians 2 verse 8 through 10 I don't know where I got Ephesians 6 from and this is in the King James Version and the reason I brought this up is because this is the basis of salvation sanctification what we should do how things are done and I, this sums up so much and it's like should be taught <laughs> we, we um we um you know talk a lot about 8 and 9 verse 8 and 9 but we forget verse 10 so I'm going to go ahead and read this and this is in the King James Version Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that is, n and that not of yourselves is, a, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so 
let, let's understand that we're not saved by our works. And the works that we have, God has ordained before the foundation of the world. He will, he will lead us into works. So we don't have to worry and focus on our works. We don't have to look to our works like the Calvinists do to see if we are saved. We look, we, we look to Christ and believe in Him and, and trust in Him by faith. And then He leads us into works later on. Or he could have led us into works, but even before we're saved, and then give them to us after we become saved. I, I truly believe that he'll do stuff like that. Like, well, you did this good work a long time ago. It was covered in all your sin. But since I paid for your sin and wiped it all, all you know, off your account, I don't remember it. You're just left standing there holding good works. So all the good works he's ordained. We don't have to worry about our works. We just you know, keep our eyes on Christ, and then we will do good works. It's when we take our eyes off of Christ and start putting him on our works to determine if we are saved or, you know, if we really do believe that we start getting into heresy and a lot of crazy ideas, and then it never, it, we end up doing works to prove that we're saved, which is not a good work. You can, if it's not from the heart out of love, it's not a good work to begin with. You can do it to try to prove you're saved, but if you're doing it to try to gain something or prove something out of a selfish motive, it's not a good work. All right, so I, I hope that, under, like, that's the basis of all works and and, you know, the saving gospel right here for Bergesia, you have been saved through faith, obviously in Jesus Christ. But anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, this is also about works and recognizing people, because a lot of the Calvinists will say that, we, you know, we have to look to our works to see if we're saved, which isn't the truth. We know in our heart whether we believe. Now, we can look to other people to see their works to get an idea if they're being honest but that doesn't that doesn't say if they're saved or not it gives us an idea and when we're looking to ourselves we're not looking to our works cuz we know if we believe in our heart or not you know if you believe the gospel so if you don't believe the gospel, you're not saved. If you do, you are saved. We don't have to look to our works in our life to determine if we are saved or not. Because our flesh can go through seasons of, of really good works, or it can go through seasons of sin where we're really doing great in this season, but in this next season, there's a lot of stuff to hap happened and, and we started to fail. So if we're looking to our performance, we will be deceived. But if we look to what we believe in our heart, do we believe? Yes, I believe. Okay, you're saved. Now, when it comes to other people, we look to them to see if they're trying to deceive us. It's just like the, the Catholics in the past that said that they believed in Christ but were torturing and burning people and, and just massacring people because of some, I don't know, maybe they didn't give money to a certain person. I don't know. It could have been anything. You know, the, the Spanish Inquisition and all of the evilness of the old Catholic Church. I mean, the Catholic Church still has a lot of problems, but it was even worse back in the day if you can believe that which I think most of you already know that. So this is <clears throat> Matthew 7:16 and this is the point I, I this is the point I was trying to make right here in the verse. It says by by their fruit and this is in the Berean study bible but whatever. By their fruit you will recognize them. And are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or are figs from thistles? Like and it goes on to say every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bad tree bears bad fruit. <clears throat> And, and this is just to know who are wolves in sheep's clothing. This isn't to look to yourself. Am I a wolf in sheep's clothing? Um, no. If you believe, you might be a Christian who doesn't understand how much the Lord has loved you, who's not grown and been sanctified if you're still doing some bad things. But this is to help determine other people. And we shouldn't go around trying to judge other people. This is just trying to keep you, you know, from being persecuted or deceived. From being, you know, if you see somebody who's saying that they're really, or acting really religious, but then they're doing some... You know, using that power to like take advantage of women sexually, you know that there's really something wrong, and they're probably lying. They never believed to begin with, because you, you, you but but you, you still don't know. Maybe they slipped into error. But you, this is something that we do to look to other people, because we can't judge the internal you know nature of someone else. All we can do is see if we believe, and if we believe, we're saved. We're not supposed to look to our works to determine if we're saved. We look to somebody else's to determine, but not to ours. And it just doesn't mean we're always right when we do that. It's just a thing to try to help us not be deceived by that person. All right, so this is Matthew 15. And this is basic, This is faith right here. And I wanted to talk about faith because this is something that... It's like a lot of the, the intellectual Christians... The, I call them intellectual Christians, and I, I, I do that tongue-in-cheek because of the whole verse, you know, I was speaking before about revealing these things to the, you know, the wise and learned. But this is faith right here, and I want to talk about this because this is something that I, I, I kind of wanted to make a separate video on to talk really what is faith. So I'm going to go ahead and read this in the King James Version. And this is the the uh, the Cana, Canaanite woman whose daughter was possessed. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read it. And behold, a woman of Cana came out of 
out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on, on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Which a demon, you know, it's, they just use devil in the King James. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered said, and said, I am not sent, uh, sent but unto the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, and saying, Lord, help me. But he answered her, but he answered and said, It is not meat to take, it is not good, or it is not time, to take the, the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, this is true. Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be unto thee, even thou wilt. And their daughter was made whole from <laughs> that very hour. Sometimes I laugh at the King James Version, be as thou, even as thou wilt. I don't know, because we don't ever speak like that. But the point is, is that even when the Lord didn't turn a kind eye to her, which he, I, I know deep inside he knew that she had faith, and, and he was trying to show the people around him what faith is. She just said truth, Lord, and she kept coming. She knew in her heart the Lord was compassionate and would do it. Not because of how good she was and not because of anything. She was called a dog, and he, but she still knew that he would do it because he, he was kind and good. And she'd probably heard this from afar, and she, and she believed. And this is an example of faith that where it's not looking to yourself to see if you deserve it. She knew she was a dog. She said truth. <laughs> right here, she said truth. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs. So she's not arguing with the Lord. She's like, Lord, you're right. I'm a sinner, but I know you're good. And you can say whatever you want. I know if I come and ask you, you'll do it and because you are good. And that is faith. And that's what saves someone. It's not looking to yourself to say, am I a dog? How did I become a dog? Do I bark like a dog? No, we don't do that. We look to the Lord and say, you are good. You are the one who saves us. And that's how that, that's what faith is. And that's saving faith is just knowing that it's not real. It doesn't matter if I'm a dog, a, 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 a goat, or a sheep, or whatever. I look to the Lord, and I trust in Him, and He will save me, even if I am a, considered a dog. Even if, you know, it, it doesn't matter. All right, so this is an example of saving faith. This is how we look and, and, and know that we have faith. This is a great, a great example. And it's not looking to our works, because this woman didn't look to her works, or if she was a dog or a cat or a pig or whatever. She looked to the Lord and said, I know he's good, and I, I've heard all the stuff about how good he is and how he heals everyone. And that's where she put her faith in. And then she was rewarded for that faith, not because she was looking to herself to see if she was a dog or not. All right, so this is John 15 through 16. And this, I wanted to pull up some of these versions, uh, versions, verses about e election, because you'll hear a lot of the Calvinists talk about basically only the elect are saved, and the reason they start trusting in their works, and I should have gone over this to begin with, is the reason they start trusting in their works is because they believe that only a certain elect are saved, but they don't know who those elect are. They, they say it's by faith, and I should have gone over this at the very beginning, and forgive me for doing that. But the, the reason they start believing these things and start trusting in their works again is they'll say it's by faith you are saved, but they don't know actually who has saving faith. So how do we know who has saving faith? Well, we look to the person's works. So it's, it's a bunch of circular reasoning. But I want to kind of talk about they don't understand what the election is. The election isn't, you know, they're elected to be saved and these people are elected to go to hell. It's these people are elected to go off and, you know, do good works for the Lord to save others. It's a special election like John the Baptist was chosen, like Moses was chosen. Now, just because Moses was chosen doesn't mean that, you know, Joshua wasn't, you know, loved by God or wasn't saved. It was just Moses had a special choose, you know, calling on him. And that's the same thing. It's almost like a ripple in a pond. The Lord chooses the pebble, throws it in, and then it creates the little ripples. And then they go off and we are, you know, given the authority and then through our testimony and our election people believe because without the Lord picking the pe person no one would be saved, and I want to prove that, that he has to pick people, not because they're the only ones saved, but so that they can go off and save others and bring even more people in. Because if he didn't do this, no one would be saved. He has to choose, because all, without, you know, without him, no one would be doing any of this. So this is just some verses to prove what election actually is. It's not about picking who's saved and who's not saved. It's just picking about who's going to go and, and go and bear fruit and sow, you know, gather the seeds and, in, you know, and reap a harvest you know, into eternal life you know, reap and gather more people and, and basically evangelize others and save others, you know, help others. All right, so this is John fifteen sixteen. 
and, and this is Jesus speaking. You do not choose me, but I chose you, and I will point to you and bear. I'll, I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This is my commitment that you love one another. Anyway, so he chose us that we would go bear fruit. All right, so I want to move on to John 20, 23. And this is basically proving to you that he's given us power to choose to forgive sins to save others the elected people that doesn't mean that those people you know who he who haven't been chosen or elected or whatever are not saved it means that he has chosen a special you know group of people and you know like Paul like the apostles like Moses like that kind, you know, like the prophets he's chosen these special people to go off and do his will which is to save all so this is John 20 20, 20 23. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. And he goes on to talk about Thomas, but in verse 22 it said, when he, when he had said this, he, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he you know, gave them the authority. Because we have the Holy Spirit now, we have the authority to forgive sins, and, and we have the authority. And, and I guess they didn't really have the authority to save people in the Old Testament, but now we do. And it's not really us saving them, but it's, you know, the election, I'm just trying to prove to you that the election isn't just, if you're elected, doesn't mean that you're the only one saved. It just means that you have a special purpose. And that's what the election was talked about all you know, throughout the New Testament, Paul used it in some ways that you could kind of think that it might only be the elect that are being saved, but that's not really how it was used by Christ, and I don't think that's how Paul meant it either. It was just, you know, the Lord chose these people to go and bear fruit and to, you know, get, because he goes on to say, and I think it's in John, and this is what I wanted to point out right here. So this is John 4.35. Yeah, 35. Do you not say that there are still four months until the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ripe with harvest. Already the reaper draws his wages and gathers a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. So right here, he's like, look up, and he goes on to say, beseech the Lord, ask the Lord to send out people into the harvest to go gather people. He's saying right here that the fields are ripe with harvest, that there's a bunch of people that can be saved, but we need the Lord to send people because people don't want to go do this on their own, and people can't do it on their own. We need the Lord to throw the pebble to start the fire. He, he you know, kindle the fi- the Bible talks about kindling a fire. And it's just he once the Lord starts something like that, it'll snowball. But it won't start without the Lord electing and choosing and and, and setting it in motion because we can apart from Him we can do nothing. All right, and, and to go on to you just emphasize this even more Isaiah one nine. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been resembled Gomorrah. Unless Jesus Christ had done what he had, you know, all the things he did, unless through the ages before he had chosen the prophets and, and you know, chosen Moses, we would all be like Sodom. We'd all be like Gomorrah. So that's the, the election right there. First Kings 19.18 and this is more just emphasizing what I'm talking about. Nevertheless, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. Again, he's talk, you know, he's saving people. He's, he's reserving these people who have not gone into Baal because if he hadn't done this, everybody would have gone over to Baal if it hadn't been for the Spirit of the Lord. And those people went on to you know, restart and, and bear more fruit, and, and people descended from them that were you know, seeking the Lord. All right, so this is Second Corinthians eleven three in the King James Version, and this sums it up. This sums up what I, the, the problem I have with all of these apologetics type videos and and the Calvinists and, and the super intellectual crowd. And, and this, this is the, the um, verse I quoted down here in my comment. You can go read, and if you don't like my comment, you can tell me. I, I I was trying to be kind, but it really go watch this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Because he attacks Bob Wilkins, and then he goes on to say the exact same thing Bob Wilkins says. Then he goes on to, to basically say he teaches phony grace, but that he actually has a clear understanding of grace. They say this in, in in the video, so they're just contradicting each other, and it makes no sense. All right. It's, it's just hypocritical. All right, this is Second Corinthians 11.3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his sub, subtlety, sub, sub I, whatever, <laughs> so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Sub, subtlety? Subtlety? Whatever. Anyway. Yeah, so basically this is right here. I, I'm afraid that they have been deceived and corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And that's my biggest fear for the Christian Answers television, but not just them, but all of the so-called, 
Calvinists and apologists and all these really intellectual people because they're they're smart, but in their you know intelligence and in their learning, they've become blinded to the simplicity of Christ, and that's my my biggest fear. All right, guys, that's all I really wanted to talk about. Let me know what you think in the comments below. God be God bless and take care.